Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk to Professor John Hoover. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Great to have you on. For those who don't know, John Hoover is Professor of Islamic Studies at the University of Nottingham here in the UK. His expertise is obviously Islamic studies, especially Islamic intellectual history, medieval Islamic theology and philosophy, the thought of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim, and Christian-Muslim theological interaction. And his current work examines uh, how Ibn Taymiyyah formulates his unique views of God's attributes in dialogue with his theological, philosophical, and socio-political context. In today's podcast, Dr. Hoover will be discussing what he calls Ibn Taymiyyah's religious utilitarianism. Now, I must admit that before I read uh, John's fascinating uh, article, which is in, in a book about this topic titled Foundations of Ibn Taymiyyah's Religious Utilitarianism, I never expected to hear the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham and his utilitarianism mentioned in the same breath as Ibn Taymiyyah. So that raised an eyebrow or two when I first read that. But it's, it's been explained very clearly what, what, what uh, you mean by that. Now, Bentham, interestingly, um, has defined as the fundamental axiom of his philosophy, the principle that, quote, it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong, end quote. So, John, please introduce us to this fascinating topic. Okay, thank you, Paul. And yes, we have the PowerPoint. So um, this is, as Paul mentioned, uh, my presentation today is based uh, largely on a book chapter that was published in 2019 called Foundations of Ibn Taymiyyah's Religious Utilitarianism. It's in a volume edited by Peter Adamson. And then um, what's really important about this article from my perspective is it is the um, theoretical backbone for uh, my 2019 book um, on Ibn Taymiyyah, which is a general introduction to his life and thought. So um, the article is giving you the theoretical background to ideas that come out in simpler form in the book. Uh, I need to say, first of all, what I mean by utilitarianism. Mm. The term utilitarianism applied to Ibn Taymiyyah is not uncontroversial. Some people find it difficult to think about a modern term being applied to somebody who lived in the late 13th and early 14th century, or uh, that such a term might apply to Islamic ethics, Islamic thought. So I want to be clear as to what I'm talking about. Yeah. Utilitarianism is a, a species of consequentialism, a broader category in ethics. Uh, consequentialists talk about acting to produce the maximum good or sometimes well-being, or benefit, or utility. And you can have that for yourself, for oneself, that's called ethical egoism, or for the maximum utility for everyone, and that's called utilitarianism. Now, uh, to distinguish Jeremy Bentham, who Paul's uh, kindly introduced already, from Ibn Taymiyyah and other thinkers in religious traditions we might uh, think about, um, I talk about secular utilitarianism and then religious utilitarianism. So the example of secular utilitarianism, uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, as Paul said, greatest happiness of the greatest number is the criteria here for happiness or the, the uh, criteria for ethics of what is right and wrong. So it's about maximizing happiness, benefit, and pleasure in this world. And then I distinguish that, uh, I distinguish that by talking about uh, religious utilitarianism, uh, which is maximizing happiness, benefit, pleasure in this world and the hereafter, or in some sense, a religious uh, component to this. This is not found only within Islamic tradition with Ibn Taymiyyah, but uh, there are some Christian examples of this as well. So the idea here is that uh, worshiping God and, and the afterlife have a role in thinking about what maximum happiness looks like. So with that explained, I'll move on to um, uh, the argument. I'm going to outline the whole argument, and then I'm going to go into detail as right. we go on. Okay. So the first thing that is the foundation of the argument, which I'm actually not going to evidence for lack of time, 
is that for Ibn Taymiyyah, worship of God alone, really, um, we can talk about two aspects. One is, it is the ultimate purpose of humanity. You may know the verse um, in the Quran that God created uh, the um, humans and the jinn for worship. And then the second aspect is worship of God alone is to the ultimate benefit of humans. Ibn Taymiyyah uh, believes that. And, you know, what is most beneficial to us human beings? It's to worship God alone. That is our, of course, you can think about this as being beneficial at attaining the afterlife, the, uh, seeing God in hereafter being the highest pleasure, and so forth. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm have ba two basic parts of my argument today. Uh, the first part is going to be that Ibn Taymiyyah thinks in terms of religious utility and ethics and law. Um, and then the second part, which is a little more complex, is that Ibn Taymiyyah also understands God's action in a utilitarian fashion. Mm. And um, for those who read the article, you'll know that I flipped them. Uh, actually, I'm doing the latter part of the article first because yes. it's the somewhat easier to understand. It is. I, 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 I agree with your, your view there. That I, I, I found the, the first, the uh, his religious utilitarianism in relation to ethics and law to be much easier to understand than... Uh, the theology uh, in the second one you listed there. So yeah, that was my response as well. Yeah, so I've flipped them so we can perhaps follow things a little bit more easily. Okay. And then um, the conclusion is that for any time, yeah, God's action and human action are both utilitarian in character, which is uh, somewhat surprising. Not only is human action utilitarian, but God even has a kind of utilitarian ethic. Okay, so let's begin then with the human side of it. So the idea that Ibn Taymiyyah's ethics are utilitarian is nothing new. Uh, I give just two examples to start us off. One from Michael Cook, his book in 2000, Commanding the Right and Forbidding the Wrong in Islamic Thought, a really thick volume, well worth reading even uh, 24 years on. And he has about three, four pages on Ibn Taymiyyah. And he tells, among other things, a story of Ibn Taymiyyah going with his uh, friends to visit the Mongol camp. So the Mongols, of course, had invaded Syria, and um, he and some friends went to see the Mos Mongols, and they uh, drank wine, of course. And some of his friends said, let's forbid them, you know, let's, let's uh, command the right here and tell them they really should not be drinking wine. And that's the wrong thing to do in God's eyes. Ibn Taymiyyah says, okay, let's, let's think about this. Uh, no, let's not uh, tell them uh, they shouldn't be drinking wine, because if we look at the big picture, um, as I read there from the quote, the Muslims stood it to suffer more if the Mongols renounced their liquor. In other words, the fact that they were drinking wine and therefore impaired mentally meant they would not be as dangerous to the Muslims in the war. So but they, they uh, are, were the Mongols at that stage Muslims, actually? It was, wasn't that the point they, they described yeah, themselves? They the Mongols in that case confessed to be Muslims. Um, yeah. But in Ibn Taymiyyah's view, they were not uh, well practicing Muslims. Yeah. And his views as his as he progressed got harsher toward them. But that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this little anecdote is um, for Cook illustrates Ibn Taymiyyah's thinking. And then a little bit more on uh, Cook. Uh, Cook brings out that for Ibn Taymiyyah, that Political authorities have a, a religious obligation, not just a secular obligation, but there's a religious obligation of political authorities to do what is best within their power, even if some it entails some undesirable consequences, even if some undesirable consequences ensue. So political authorities in deciding what to do should weigh up the benefits and detriments of their actions and not just... Uh, live completely apart from morality, but not be so scrupulous that they uh, are tied up in knots and can't get anything done. So that's yeah. the second point here on the slide. It's not politics without morality. That means unscrupulous behavior by the rulers. And it's not morality without politics. In other words, complete scrupulosity. The ruler is very concerned to do everything exactly right, such that they miss the big picture and might not say defend the Muslim borders from an invader. So mm. it's about balancing the two. So that's what Cook brings out of Ibn Taymiyyah's thinking. Mm. Another example um, 
another scholar who's thought about this quite a bit is, is Yahya Misho. He talks about Ibn Taymiyyah's profound utilitarianism. Yes. And uh, Misho writes about this in a number of places, but I decided to highlight his book, Muslims Under Non-Muslim Rule, which was published in 2006. He talks in here, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah is thinking about weighing up benefits, masala in Arabic, and detriments, uh, mafasid, uh, of each act. Yeah. And he gives lots of examples in the book, but one I find really fascinating. Uh, it's the question, should we leave the company of disobedient and perverse people? Now, in Arabic, this is the term hijra. So we think of the, the prophet's hijra from um, Mecca to Medina, but Ibn Taymiyyah is generalizing this. Whenever we find ourselves in the midst of a uh, people who are bad company, should we undertake hijra away from them. So his view on this is, yes, normally we should leave, but we shouldn't leave if staying brings more benefit than detriment, or conversely, if leaving would cause greater detriment than benefit. Now, what might be the benefit of hanging out with bad company? Well, if we leave uh, a Muslim bad company, uh, we might lose access to the religious knowledge they um, they have. So this is in, in the early centuries of Islam. We have the hadith, for example, of the Prophet Muhammad are spread throughout the community. They aren't all collected yet. So there's a risk if you decide that some other part of the Muslim community is not really good company for you and you cut yourself off from them, you might be cutting yourself off from some religious knowledge that they happen to have, which would be detrimental, perhaps even more detrimental than hanging out with them. Yeah. So um, I, I found this example uh, really helpful to understand Ibn Taymiyyah and his thinking and what um, uh, the types of considerations one should take in making decisions about what to do. Now, um, Ibn Taymiyyah has another side of his thinking about uh, ethics and law and so forth, um, which is intention, we might think, with this utilitarian outlook. And that is, there is a law. There is a religious law. There's a sharia. And it presumably would tell us what we should do and shouldn't do without having to think about uh, benefits and detriments. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, though, um, he considers the law equivalent to justice. And as I'll show on the next slide, the law is equivalent to benefit. But let's look at this quotation first about um, the law and justice. So anytime he writes in a mm. treatise um, that's found in Mejmoa Fatawa, which is his the big modern collection of, of his writings in volume 35, the book and justice are inseparable. So that's Sharia and Ad are inseparable. The book ex explicates the law. The law is justice and justice is the law. Anyone who judges with justice judges with the law. The entire revealed law is justice. So he's equating the law and justice, you can talk about it either way. Mm -hmm. They're equivalent. And you can have justice apart from the law insofar as he talks about this elsewhere. A non-Muslim ruler may be ruling according to justice. And if they are truly ruling according to justice, that's actually better than a bad Muslim ruler who is unjust. But mm. justice and Sharia coincide. They're inseparable. Mm. And this parallels with Ibn Taymiyyah's well-known view that revelation and reason do not contradict. That's not the topic yeah. of the presentation, but it, he's really well known for the idea that, that reason and revelation say the same things. They, you can come at truth from both directions. Of course, mm -hmm. revelation gives you things you can't know by reason, like exactly how to pray the five daily prayers and so forth. But uh, on basics of religious truth about God, God's attributes and so forth, there is just simply no contradiction. If you are reasoning in a certain fashion, it doesn't agree with revelation, you're off. And if you're reading revelation in a certain fashion, it does, it does not agree with reason, you're off in his thinking. Um, now we bring that to benefit. He says, likewise, uh, so likewise, for being time, law and human benefit are coextensive. The benefit is the law and the law is benefit. That's my uh, wording. I've not seen him put it quite that way, but that's what it comes to. And there's no real benefit outside the law. 
What he does say in a treatise where he talks about this a lot, uh, the principle overall is that the law never neglects a benefit. Indeed, God exal exalted as he has perfected the religion for us and completed the blessing. The prophet, may God bless him and give him peace, has indeed spoken about everything, so the law, everything that will bring us closer to the garden, so the garden of paradise. Now, Sophia Vassilou has has observed this, as others have observed this uh, uh, thinking within Ibn Taymiyyah. And uh, Sophia Vassilou wrote this book, Ibn Taymiyyah's Theological Ethics in 2016, which I'm uh, drawing from very briefly. It's an extensive book. It's really um, a sophisticated piece of work. But one uh, thing... I, I, the way, sorry, I just love the way, by the way, she uh, interacts with Western uh, scholars I mean, she, uh, and, and uh, thinkers and philosophers like she mentions Voltaire, she mentions David Hume uh, and others. She is a very rich uh, interreligious, interphilosophical discourse in her book, which makes it very, for me, very fascinating because I'm very interested, obviously, in the, both the Islamic tradition and the Western tradition to the extent that they overlap or interconnect that way. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's, that's Sophia Vassilou is one of her really strong points. She's conversant in both traditions exactly. and can tie them together. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, one thing she notes is that for Ibn Taymiyyah, revelation specifies all human benefits, just what I've been saying. She concludes from that, though, uh, that Ibn Taymiyyah is just rationalizing the revealed law. He's saying, yeah, benefit, that's rational. And that's what the revealed law gives us. And so she concludes in a certain fashion that therefore there's not much left for us to do in terms of thinking. So mm. Ibn Taymiyyah is just rationalizing the revealed law, making it look really great, really beneficial. And that leaves very little room for independent ethical reasoning. And she's right, but I would argue only to a point. Mm. Um, because he is indeed rationalizing the revealed law as fully congruent with our full benefit, there's no benefit that's, um, you know, there's no real benefit outside the law. If any time he does, I don't have this on a further slide, but I should clarify. He does see benefit uh, for people doing things that are outside the law, like practicing, according to him, celebrating the prophet's birthdays outside the law. Mm. Um, and he sees even that some people can benefit from practicing it, but he then says, uh, and they can even get a certain reward from benefit practicing it or celebrating it, but the detriments are always greater than the benefits. So therefore it doesn't congruent with the law and you shouldn't do it because if you would rather pray um, the, the ritual prayers and, and other um, supererogatory works, that'll be beneficial as opposed to celebrating the prophet's birthday, which on the whole is detrimental, hmm. but he doesn't deny there might be some benefit in there for some That's people true. to a certain yeah. degree. So back to the Quran itself speaks in those terms about uh, drinking wine or, or intoxicants rather, which are prohibited. But nevertheless, it says there there is some benefit in them, but the harm is far greater. And I, th I think the same with gambling as well. It mentions those yeah. two specifically. So it's a very kind of nuanced position here. It, it's not kind of very uh, binary. There, there is a sense of balancing out the, the the consequences and the costs and the benefits. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, that leads very nicely to the next slide. Um, this is what I think Vassilou doesn't quite fully grasp. Mm. Um, the utilitarian principle at work in every time he is um, thinking. And in particular, it's what do you do when following the law perfectly and attaining full benefit is not possible? Mm. This can be for any number of reasons. It could be um, because of human weakness or it could be human ignorance. We just don't know because we haven't studied the law adequately. Um, he's very reticent. He thinks the law does speak to everything important. I should qualify here. There are particular things that we always have to reason out. For example, which direction do you pray? Okay. Mm. The law says you should pray toward Mecca. But when you're in different parts of the world, you have to figure that out on your own. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about when you are simply ignorant of the law because you haven't studied well enough or you don't know somebody who knows it well enough or because there's uh, too much human weakness or, or corruption in the land and you simply can't follow the law perfectly and attain full benefit, it's simply not possible. So how do you figure out what you're supposed to do? So I have this long quote here, which I'm going to read in full, mm. uh, where he answers this question. 
He says one has to investigate. If the right is greater, it is commanded, even if it necessarily entails something wrong of lesser import. Wrong is not prohibited if prohibiting it necessarily entails losing something right greater than it. Mm. Indeed, prohibiting in that case would be tantamount to blocking the way of God. If the wrong is predominant, then it is, pre then it is prohibited. Even if this involves losing something less right or right, losing something right that is less than it. Commanding that lesser right that involves a greater wrong is commanding wrong and furthering disobedience to God and his messenger. If right and wrong are intertwined and equally in balance, then they are neither commanded nor prohibited. Mm. Sometimes it is beneficial to command and sometimes it is beneficial to prohibit. It all depends on the specific and actual circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Can, 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 I, can I give an example from your excellent chapter um, in, in your book uh, on uh, page um, uh, 32, actually, where you, 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 uh, where you reference an example that Ibn Taymiyyah gives um, where um, omitting a prohi prohibition of a wrong averts another wrong that would be even more detrimental. He gives an example. He notes that, uh, that a king who converts to Islam should not be prohibited from drinking wine if prohibition would lead him to apostatize. Uh, and and that, that's fascinating, T typical of the of his cost benefit analysis here that, you know, instead of simply having a very kind of simplistic raw bound uh, application of law, while well, the king is, uh, you know, drinking, he must be you know, uh, knowing the king would apostate, but the greater harm there would be losing the king completely and perhaps, perhaps even having a, a non-Muslim ruler. And I thought that that, that subtlety uh, of, of thought there, that hikmah, the wisdom actually was, yeah. was very striking. And you give a number of examples in, in your chapter about that actually. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I'm actually going to mention that example in a, a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, I, that's okay. I, uh, no problem. That's your there, sorry. It um, mm. and you're absolutely right. He's he's trying to encourage us to think subtly and carefully about what we're doing, rather than just say, "Oh, God commanded us to do this, therefore we do it." Um, exactly. And perhaps in the in the process, create all sorts of trouble that far exceeds the. <laughs> and, and this is not a bidder this is not an innovation of course because he ties it or roots it very much in the in the practice the sunnah of the prophet muhammad upon whom be peace and he, he, you you mentioned some of those examples this is actually very orthodox uh islam really but it's expressed in in a very kind of philosophical theoretical way uh to bring out the issues the the underlying principles at stake yeah and, and the underlying principle is the utilitarian principle yeah um, yeah, so um, there's a treatise um, that Ibn Taymiyyah wrote uh, that a couple of scholars have drawn upon, but nobody's drawn upon, nobody sort of surveyed the whole thing. And that's what I do in, in my book chapter. Um, so I call this section uh, Treatise on the Caliphate, of course, Utilitarian Principle and Practice, Ibn Taymiyyah's Treatise on the Caliphate. Now, the problem he's addressing here is that we have in Sunni Islam, the uh, Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs, and the Khulafat al-Rashidun. Um, and we can call this, and Ibn Taymiyyah calls this first four caliphs period, so that's the, the caliphate of, um, of Abu Bakr, then Omar, then Uthman, then Ali, the, the um, caliphate of prophecy. So this afterwards fell into kingship, and Ibn Taymiyyah says, of course, people after that were called caliphs, but in Islamic political thinking, there's this idea that there was a kind of falling away from the ideal after mm -hmm. that initial period. Yeah. And different political theorists in the Islamic tradition have wrestled with this in different ways. So this is what Ibn, this is what Ibn Taymiyyah does here in this case. You know, so how serious is this problem, really? Mm -hmm. um, for Ibn Taymiyyah, it's not too serious. Um, he says, a king who does a lot of good with a bit of evil mixed in is better than someone who does a little good and avoids evil entirely. So he has in mind here the person who is so bound up by concern for doing the right thing that they can't see the big picture of what needs doing in order to achieve the longer term goal or the wider societal goals of producing a society in which uh, worship can take place. And in fact, 
encouraging people to worship God. And that's the role of the ruler in his eye, in his thinking is that they are supposed to um, uh, encourage and facilitate the worship of God. I bet. Yeah. Um, so he says in, in his view, then the caliphate of prophecy is an obligation, but it's lack is not a major sin. So the fact there's not the prophecy or caliphate of prophecy in that technical sense of the early ideal period that's just a minor sin and sometimes uh, we have to indulge human weakness in sin in order to get on with it as it were um, in his view now I need to clarify here you'll find in many uh, books on Islamic political theory that Ibn Taymiyyah says uh, the caliphate is not required at all it's not an obligation on the Muslim community um, there's a scholarship that I'm drawing on, a very recent scholarship, so that's not correct, that he does hold the caliphate to be an obligation, but it's not the reality of the day, and it's simply too difficult to put into practice, and he's making an allowance. It's a minor sin, and we can achieve still a lot of good in terms of advancing religion and um, helping people worship without having the perfect caliphate in place can, can i just pause on, on that on that very important point that you just made uh particularly in western scholarship uh, i mean without going into the etiology of it that, ha that there has been this profound error uh, and misunderstanding and, uh, and mistranslating ibn timir's point on the caliphate uh, and this is being corrected now in more recent scholarship not least by yourself uh, and some other scholars who uh, ibn, ibn timir did see the, uh, the caliphate as obligatory but uh, his absence was a sin um, but uh, in the way you, you, you describe, and, and also he's taking into account of human weakness and human sinfulness uh, as an important understanding and context for implementing uh, Islam. So I, I think I'm just grateful you're stressing that point that that Temir did see the the, uh, the caliphate as as obligatory, but nevertheless in the caveated sense that you've just described. Yeah, thank you. So um, another long quote where he uh, talks about, whoops, sorry, um, where he talks about the, uh, okay, sorry, I'm having trouble here. Yeah, okay. we got it. Um, Treaty of Caliphate. Okay, I'm probably the, all right, here, yeah, good. Uh, so he says an example, what he's talking about here is examples of human weakness requiring us to accept that things aren't perfect and that yeah. we still act for the good as much as possible. An example is the public leader who cannot bring himself to achieve the benefits of administrative authority in commanding the right and prohibiting the wrong, carrying out prescribed punishments, securing the roads, undertaking jihad against the enemy and distributing resources without engaging in some prohibited things like expropriating some of the resources domineering the people, showing favoritism and distribution, and other such capricious behaviors. This gets really interesting now. The scholar, so the religious scholar, is not able to bring himself to study the science of jurisprudence and the theological foundations of religion without certain kinds of prohibited things like ungrounded opinion and rationalist theology. And he cannot bring himself to study the science of the legislated rights of worship and the knowledge that is commanded without a certain kind of monkishness. Now, uh, now, you, you make a really interesting point uh, here in your uh, book chapter. I hope you're going to expand on this. This last sentence about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you tell us. About that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Yahya Misho um, has a whole article on this in French, mm -hmm. in which he speculates that perhaps Ibn Taymiyyah's reason for never marrying, and Ibn Taymiyyah mm -hmm. did believe that uh, a man should marry. Yeah. Um, but Ibn Taymiyyah himself never did it. So this is a, a uh, part of the, the law, which he didn't keep. Um, so Misho speculates that perhaps Ibn Taymiyyah rationalized his disobedience with the need to dedicate his time and energy fully to his scholarship and his religious reform activity. Yes. Um, the thing is, Ibn Taymiyyah never really comes out and says this, but it's a, it's a useful speculation. It's the only one I've ever heard, because I've often wondered why did even Tanya married. But obviously, he was completely married in a sense, or uh, devoted to his work. And he's an incredibly productive man, uh, whether he's in prison or not, or whatever he was doing. He was churning out these incredible treaties. 
Uh, but why did he never marry? And I, I think, you know, it was a weakness, perhaps, uh, as, as, as he says in this particular quote. He could not bring himself to study the science and the legislative rights of worships and the knowledge that is commanded without a certain degree of, you know, retreat from the world, retreat from the pleasures of marriage, not indulging in that. So it was a weakness on his part. And, and I agree it's not proof, but it's the best theory I've come across yet. It's certainly compelling. Yeah. Good. Um, another example, which you, Paul, have already mentioned, uh, is do not tell a king who converted to Islam not to drink wine if that would lead him to apostatize. And then every time he ends this um, whole treatise making the point that according to the circumstances, the prophet's position um, varied regarding his, his command, his prohibition, his jihad, his pardon, his carrying out of the prescribed punishments, the hudud punishments, his harshness and his mercy. So mm -hmm. uh, the prophet's position um, is utilitarian calculation. So my conclusion to this first half of my argument is yeah. for Ibn Taymiyyah, utilitarian calculation is the way of the prophet. Exactly. When it's not possible to follow the law perfectly um, or there's simply uh, a lack of knowledge about what that might look like uh, in the respective circumstances. I think it's a really important point. If, if I may go completely off subject for a second, I, I've, I noted reading the, the Christian Gospels in the New Testament, the way Jesus is sometimes portrayed, exhibits these kinds of qualities, I think. In other words, he is not legalistic. He sometimes uh, acknowledges human weakness and sinfulness, like the woman caught in adultery, for example, the way he treats there. Not, not denying the law, but nevertheless seeing other contextual factors in operation. So I, 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 there's a bit of Jesus in, in this as well, if I may put it that way. But that's not your point, so just my point. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, perhaps what they share is a, uh, is a bit of shrewdness and, and care and concern in exercising their yeah. religious vocations. Yeah. Exactly. That's what we're putting it. Yeah. Right. Now we move to the second part of the argument, which is the theological implications of this uh, utilitarian vision. And we can talk about the ethics of God's actions. What is it that God is up to, you might say, in creating the world in, um, you know, what what it's it's. I hesitate to use the word, what governs God's actions, but if we can use that expression, what governs God's actions, if we think of God governing God's self. In any case, Sophia Vassalou has this brilliant quote here. She says, Ibn Taymiyyah's account of God's morality echoes nothing, if not the axiom of utilitarianism articulated by Bentham. It is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. So what she's picked up on here is that God himself is, if you look at Ibn Taymiyyah's thinking, is acting in a utilitarian fashion. God is concerned about consequences. God's confirmed, concerned about benefit and avoiding detriment. Mm -hmm. um, but this, that's a simple way of putting what God's up to. God, by the way, I can add here, God is about having everybody worship God alone and doing what is uh, possible within the limitations of the way the world is created um, to lead people to that point. So maximum happiness for uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, his view of God is uh, everybody worshiping God. And that is what God's seeking as well through God's creation and command in the world. Now, so to attain benefit, God acts for wise purposes or causes that's given, but how does this work? And this is where it, becomes really fascinating theologically. So Ibn Taymiyyah has this treatise called Irada, which is oh, about um, 70, 80 pages in Mejmu'a Fatawa, the big collection of his writings in volume eight. And I outline this whole article or this whole treatise actually in my book chapter. I'm just gonna pull out some bits here, but one thing Ibn Taymiyyah uh, is facing is this trilemma. In fact, this is the origin of the treatise. Somebody presents him with this trilemma, this, this problem. So I quote it here. Uh, Concerning the goodness of the will of God, does God create for a cause or for other than a cause? If it is said not for a cause, then God is aimless. Exalted is God above that. And, you know, heaven forbid that God should be aimless. Um, 
if it is said for a cause, and if you say that it is eternal, that is, if the cause is eternal, it follows necessarily that the effect is eternal. And if you say that the cause is temporally originated, or muhtatha, it follows necessarily that it had a cause, and that cause had a cause, and that cause had a yeah. cause, and so on, uh, into an endless chain, but an endless chain or an endless regress is absurd. So that's the puzzle that Ibn Taymiyyah was presented with. Yeah, it's not, it's not Ibn Taymiyyah's puzzle, it's one that he was presented with, and that's and he interacts with the, the, the philosophical assumptions and so on in that, yeah. Yeah, um, it's not to say that he hadn't thought about this before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a puzzle I'm sure he was thinking about, and it just was triggered. Uh, he, he, uh, the treatise was it, triggered it, by this uh, presentation. As a kid, I expect he was thinking about this, knowing him. But anyway, yeah. yeah. So who are these people that are in scope here? So who says that God acts not for a cause? Well, this is the Ash'ari tradition, the idea that God doesn't, uh, have purposes to God's acts. And so a negative assessment of that is that God is aimless. And I'll say more a bit in a bit about why they think that God doesn't act for a cause. Now, if it's said for a cause and that that cause is eternal, then the effect is eternal and the world's eternal. Yeah. Uh, the argumentation here is that of the philosophers like Ibn Sina uh, or otherwise known as Avicenna. And then the third uh, position, if you say that the cause is temporally originated, it comes into being in time, um, then it follows that that had a cause and so on into an endless chain. The Mu'tazilis don't quite say this, but they do say that God acts for a cause, which is temporally originated. Um, mm. They would say it doesn't go back in an endless chain. But nonetheless, and other people too, like the Karamiya um, and Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, says a num lots of people from the from the Hanbalis and the Shafis and the Hanafis and the the uh, the Malikis come out on this position. I think he's being a bit generous there, but uh, uh, he clearly is favoring the third position without coming down clearly and saying this is my view. But so where does he come out and how does he get there? That's that's the question here. Um, so let's for look first at the Ash'ari objections to God acting for a wise purpose or a cause. First, God acting for wise purposes or causes would entail an infinite regress, which is impossible in their view. Each cause would need a prior cause to bring it into existence. Second objection, it would entail temporarily originating events or hawadith in God's essence. This means there would be things going on temporarily. There would be time in God's essence. And there would be change in God's essence. And I should say that's simply wrong. Um, third point, God acting for a wise purpose or a cause would imply that God was imperfect beforehand and not self-sufficient prior to acting, but then was perfected by achieving his wise purpose. So God was perfect and because, or imperfect, and since God was imperfect and not self-sufficient, God had to do something about it, uh, had to do a little work, as it were, to attain full perfection. And for the Ashadis, this is simply... Uh, and. I mean, without, without anticipating uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's response, but uh, I, I just say that I, I always find Ibn Taymiyyah's responses to these seemingly straight-jacketed philosophical conundrums to be very uh, creative and thinking outside of the the box, so to speak, and quite simply brilliant uh, and and almost breathtaking when I when one first comes across them, and and that's one of the reasons I have a great deal of respect for him as as a thinker is his, his subtlety and sophistication of his mind is truly incredible i, I think he's, he stands as alongside other great geniuses in in the west and in islamic tradition uh one can list, list names but he is truly of the first order i mean that's my personal praise of yeah. him uh, um, well it's, he's he's a uh, yeah and he he cuts to the cuts to the quick really well and hmm. He does think uh, he has to think outside the box if he's going to break yeah. through these challenges. Yeah. And what's even, you know, in terms of uh, um, it, it took me a long time to break through these nuts as well, because, you know, a lot of theological thinking is of a certain kind, like the Ashadis, and to actually see what he's doing um, and grasp that is not easy mm -hmm. uh, either. But um, yeah. Yeah, it takes perseverance. So uh, the Ashadis Ashidi, conclude from all this that uh, God does not act for wise purposes or causes. God doesn't uh, 
God, to put it simply, doesn't do things for reasons. Uh, God's will is eternal. But, so that means God is purpose. is not acting for purpose. God is what's uh, called, he's acting according to voluntaristic. He's just a, a voluntarist. He does whatever God, God does what God's will. There's no reason you can't ask why. Will, pure will. He just does things because he wills. Will. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's extraordinary if you're if you're kind of scored in the quran and the way uh the, the prophetic tradition speaks of god you think what a strange view to have actually but that's why i gave my own personal response and you can I perhaps understand better even Temir's response uh but hey that's my own judgment yeah in defense of the ashadis i mean their own defense is that it gives god the highest glory and power to think of god's will as being uh without cause um it's, it gives God all the power and the glory. That's their that's their defense, you might say. Mm. Um, but also in terms of, of uh, temporality, uh, the Ashadi say God's will is eternal. It's outside time. And additionally, the world had a beginning. So you know, that's to rule out this whole uh, business of a infinite regress. Okay, now what about the Mu'tazilis? So like mm. the Ashadis, the world had a beginning and God is not subject to temporal events but against the ashadis uh, they say a god who does not act for wise purposes or causes is vain and foolish basically irrational a god who doesn't act for a reason is simply acting for no reason um so they would say god acts for wise purposes or god acts for purposes that are disjoined from god's essence uh, why disjoined? Well, because if these wise purposes were inside of God, then God would be temporal. So these are wise purposes that benefit humanity because in the uh, Mu'tazili um, theology of God's justice, God is trying to do what is best for humanity. Mm. And God has an obligation, in fact, to act on the to the benefit of humanity. But they put the purposes outside of God's essence because they want to retain God's integrity if you will or um yeah god's not being subject to anything temporal and, and also they don't want god to be impacted by these uh wise purposes because god is above being in need of of doing things in order to attain his perfection so god for the matazi is above all of our human uh the vicissitudes of our human experience but yet god is working for our benefit but that working for our benefit needs to take outside of out take place outside of god's essence in order to protect god's essence from uh any kind of temporality or change so the ashadis are singularly unimpressed with this um <laughs> they say they retort even wise purposes that are disjoined from god will still somehow subject god to temporality and such a God will still suffer from being perfected by his wise purposes in some fashion. He simply can't escape it. So we move on then to the philosophers, or Ibn Sina in particular. Um, the philosophers look at both the Ashadis and the Mu'tazilis. Of course, they're both in the category of Kalam theology. And the philosophers say that these two groups cannot avoid temporal origination and change in God's essence if, in fact, God is created with a will so you can't pretend that you can get temporality out of an eternal will or you can't pretend to get temporality or God's, uh, you know, you can't have this disjoined stuff that the um, Mu'tazilis are talking about it, it's simply not going to work and it's all going to involve changing God and that would make God imperfect so the philosopher's way of approaching this matter is that the timelessly eternal God emanates the world as an eternal effect Therefore, the world's eternal. Now, uh, if you're familiar with Ibn Sina's philosophy, there's a whole bunch of emanations. There, there are 10 intellects and so forth. All of this is to provide some distance between the simple, timeless, eternal God and the multiplicity of our world. But that whole scheme, that emanation from God is eternal. It's a, it's a singular eternal effect from right. God. It seems to be drawing very heavily on Plotinus, the uh, the 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 Neoplatonic Neoplatonic uh, philosopher, who certainly wasn't a Muslim uh, or, or a Christian particularly. In his book, the Aeneads, uh, which I, I think speaks, I, I think, I mean, without going into the etiology of these beliefs, because uh, I'm, I'm reading Plotinus at the moment and I'm just struck by okay. the similarity. Mm. Yeah, no, indeed, uh, Ibn Sina is a species of Neoplatonism, with a good yeah. bit of Aristotle included. 
So um, additionally for the philosophers, God does not act for purposes um, because that would also obviously introduce some kind of change in God. God's will is tantamount to God's knowledge because uh, God cannot be willing the way we do or the way, um, you know, even the Ashadis think. Um, and for the philosophers, God is not lacking in perfection. Uh, God in his perfection loves himself and from his self love flows the best possible world. So God's fundamental relation is with God's self and not with the world. The world is a, a necessary concomitant. That's the language or an emanation from God. It's something, it's a, it's a, an accidental product, but a necessary accidental product, uh, of who God is in God's self. Well, back to the trilemma, just to review where we are. Uh, we're talking about the goodness of the will of God and does God create for a cause? For the Ashadis, uh, God does not create for a cause. And so his critic, the critics of the Ashadis say that uh, God's aimless. The philosophers say God creates for a cause that is eternal, which leads to an eternal effect, which for the Ashadis and the Mu'tazilis, and Ibn Taymiyyah for that matter, um, is wrong. And then uh, the Mu'tazilis uh, talk about a temporally originated cause, but God is indeed acting here for a cause. It just is temporally originated. That leads to an endless chain, which is absurd according to the trilemma. So where's Ibn Taymiyyah go from here? Uh, against the Ashadis, what we get here is a dynamic God. So it's the title of the slide here, Dynamic God of Ibn Taymiyyah. So against the Ashadis, he says, a God who does not create for wise purposes is vain and foolish, just like the Mu'tazilis say. Um, he also says an eternal will cannot create temporal events. Um, this is very important to understand for Ibn Taymiyyah. You simply cannot get temporality out of something that is timeless. Hmm. And the Ashadis view the will of God as timeless. They say that's what a will means. Al-Ghazali is well known for this that what it means for God to have a will is to make that transition from eternity to uh, temporality. So it's in the very nature of God's eternal will that God will or enact temporal events. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah does not buy that. Against the philosophers, Ibn Taymiyyah says, uh, there's no emanation, there's no eternal effect. Um, temporality cannot arise from timeless eternity. Same criticism he has against the Ashadis. Against the Mu'tazilis, he says, well, if you're going to disjoin wise purposes or causes from God's essence, then they're not gods anymore. <laughs> he gives an example in a different context um, of if God creates the hair on my head, is this God's hair or my hair? It's obviously my hair. So um, if God creates wise purposes that are outside of God, they're the wise purposes of something, somebody else or something else. They're not gods anymore. So it's simply nonsensical. And then against the Mu'tazilis, he also said God is not indifferent to creatures. Um, whereas the Mu'tazilis are trying to hold God's, um, you know, preserve God's uh, uh, integrity or whatever from interference from creatures. Ibn Taymiyyah says this is simply not the case. It's irrational for God not to act for his own benefit and praise. Mm -hmm. And this is where Ibn Taymiyyah might surprise some. He is saying if God's not acting uh, for God's own interests, this is actually irrational. So I have a quote which puts that clearly. Um, well, before I get to the quote, I sum up here the dynamic God of Ibn Taymiyyah. God in his perfection, so God is perfect according to Taimiyah. God in his perfection, number two, acts and creates by his will and power. So God's action is triggered, or the instruments of God's acts are his will and power. In Ashadi theology, uh, because God's will is eternal, it's very difficult to connect God's power to that eternal will, and it looks like the act is in time, so it doesn't really hold together very well. Ibn Taymiyyah says very clear that God acts by means of his will and power. So this is part, like, of it, part of his essence, his will and his power, part of his essence, and not kind of semi-detached attributes that are not hmm. part of God's purpose. Right. Yeah, I mean, the Ashadis wouldn't say that 
God's attributes are not part of God, uh, of course, but the point of them being eternal is that they're not subject to change. They're right. not subject to act, temporal activity. And Ibn Taymiyyah says, well, then you can't get temporal activity out of them. Rather, mm -hmm. my view of God is that God acts for and creates by his will and power. The will and power are active. They're active temporally. And so it, it makes more sense. And then God acts for wise purposes or causes that three things subsist in his essence as temporal events. They regress infinitely into the past and they redound to his own benefit. So Ibn time he has no problem with a dynamic view of God in mm. a temporal sense. Mm -hmm. He's not saying God is subject to time. Rather, he's saying that time arises out of God's activity. Right. So uh, God doesn't, um, God is not somehow bound. Time is not something that's outside of God. It's something that arises out of God's perfection. And indeed, there's, there's a detail of the problem I have made upon it, that God is time. Uh, just throw that in. Oh. Um, oh. I didn't put those two together. Yeah, I'm aware of the Hadith, but... Um, yeah, okay. You said, you said time is a part of God. It's not something external or above him. Therefore, God, in some sense, is time, if that hadith is relevant to this. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know if any time he deals with that hadith, but there's a sense in which that would certainly fit here. Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, so about this uh, God benefiting, benefiting from God's own acts, he has a quotation from this treatise Irada, which I'm following. Anyone who commits an act in which there is neither pleasure nor benefit nor profit for himself in any respect, neither sooner nor later, is aimless, and he is not praised for this. And to Ibn time, he is mine. This applies to God and humans alike. Yep. So God acts for wise purposes that redound to his own benefit. Uh, two other quotations which bring out the ideas uh, just mentioned. In Manhaj Sunnah, which is Ibn Taymiyyah's big refutation of Twelver Shiism, he writes, God has been active from eternity when he willed with acts that subsist in his self or in his essence by his power and his will one after another. In other words, in temporal sequence. Another quotation from Manhaj Sunnah, acting is an attribute of perfection. God exalted as he has said, is then he who creates as one who does not create? Will you not then remember? That being the case, in other words, is then he who creates as one who does not create? Obviously, somebody who creates is better than one who does not create. That being the case, it is reasonable that the agent who acts by his will and his power is more perfect than one having no power and no will. So activity is the height of perfection for Ibn Taymiyyah, not mm -hmm. eternal perfection that is still, um, that is unmoving, that is um, fixed. Is, yeah. So, uh, I was going to say static and, and quite Greek, actually. I'm, I'm trying to bite my tongue here. I'm not going on, ah, oh, Greek philosophy, Greek philosophy. But I, I'm just reminded of, of Plato's, uh, uh, well, I'm just reading Plato's Republic as well. We talked about his, his theory of forms and the good. This is a very static conception as opposed to the temporal changing realm. And I, I keep on hearing the influence of Greek philosophy uh, in, in, in some of this. Not in Ibn Taymiyyah, of course. Yeah, well, I mean, the idea behind that is that the per what is perfect is so perfect that if you move away from it in any direction, it's going to become imperfect. So it mm -hmm. has to be static. And timeless, whereas Ibn Taymiyyah is simply turning all that on its head. Yeah. And uh, in that sense, he's very uh, modern. Um, he is profoundly anti-Platonic. But you made an interesting point in your chapter in your book. You say he's not to be confused with modern process theologians like mm -hmm. A.M. What is it? What A.M. Whitehead, the the uh, I think it was the British. Uh, uh, Christian philosopher who, uh, without going into process theology, is a completely different subject, but actually it is very different and not to be confused with that. I thought that was a very helpful uh, juxtaposition there. Yeah, thank you for raising that. Ibn Taymiyyah is, so Whitehead and process theology, process philosophy, uh, um, opens up the possibility uh, that God could go out of existence if things don't, if we, in fact, as human beings in the, in the universe. So God's body is the universe. Mm. 
whereas Ibn Taymiyyah does not hold to that at all. Um, and for Ibn Taymiyyah, God is indestructible, whereas for process theology, God is not entirely indestructible. So uh, process theology, to put it very concretely, um, would say if we don't take care of our universe, we don't take care of our planet, we don't take care of our uh, environment, we could just mess everything up and we could, you know, put ourselves out of existence. Any time he would have none of that because for him, God is indestructible and the universe is not God's body. So there's big differences there. But yep. any time his view of God is dynamic, like process yep. theology. Exactly. Um, there's activity and there's there's a possibility of, uh, of a different story coming in the future as there were different stories in the past. But how does he think about that? So let's, let's keep going. Um, yep. How does he respond to the Ashadi objections? So one of the Ashadi objections was God acting for wise purposes or causes would entail infinite regress. Each cause would need a prior cause to bring it into existence. So Ibn Taymiyyah, in fact, refutes these arguments, and I haven't even given the arguments against infinite regress that the Ashadis bring forth, um, and he refutes what they do say in his Menhaj Sunnah and to some degree in Dar al Ta'arud, which is his... Um, largest his masterwork on the um, congruity of revelation and reason yeah. now these arguments are opaque they're difficult and they require a separate session um, if we were to go into them i'm not sure it's that valuable to go into them into them certainly not here but point is he allows an infinite regress he has no problem with that uh second ashadi objection it would entail temporality or rather it would entail temporally originating originating events hawadith in god's essence if we had God acting for purposes, and there would be change in God, heaven forbid, there'd be change in God. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah affirms temporally originating events in God's essence. He doesn't have problems. He doesn't think this endangers God's simplicity. It, rather, I should say, it. Re, he thinks of God's simplicity differently. He doesn't think of it as uh, having no uh, differentiation within God. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't particularly like this word, temporally originating events. It's a, it's a word from Kalam. He acknowledges that his position is what, that's what that is. It's what he's talking about. But he prefers to refer to these originating events rather as God's voluntary attributes and acts. So they're things based on God's will, God acting by God's power and will. God does not change according to Taymiyyah. Um, now, this is a bit of a, a terminological shift. Of course, God is temporally active, but what God, what Ibn Taymiyyah means here is that God is consistent in his attributes and character. So we can talk about God's faithfulness. We can talk about God's love. We can talk about God's mercy. God is consistent in exercising these things. That doesn't mean that God has somehow got this singular character or singular attribute of mercy, which never changes yeah. and is, is um, eternally timeless, timelessly eternal. Definitely a more dynamic uh, conception of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, the perhaps the most difficult uh, critique of the Ashadis, uh, God acting for a wise purpose or cause would imply that God was imperfect and not self-sufficient prior to acting, and then perfected, God perfected himself by achieving his wise purpose. God was making up for some lack within himself by um, acting for a wise purpose. So, Ibn Taymiyyah says, fine, yeah, that's great. It is rational to be perfected, perfected by one's acts, not a problem. Um, I, I love the way he just simply turns the whole thing on its head and says, no problem. <laughs> Beat that. You know? I mean, with one master stroke, he simply boom, disappears, the problem. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> indeed. It's, it's quite striking. Uh, continuing along the same lines, he says, a God who cannot act for wise purpose is imperfect and not praiseworthy. Um in other words, if you have somebody who's acting like the Ashadis, according to an eternal will with no reasons, they simply not, what they're doing is, is not praiseworthy. It's not perfect. You can't call that, call that type of activity perfect. Certainly you wouldn't do that in human affairs, no. he would argue. And he argues further that what God creates is the best possible. Um, in other words, God is creating the best of all possible worlds. Um, and also, I'm very, I mean, this is completely off topic and, and it's a diversion, but I can't help but think of Voltaire's Candide and Pangloss, whenever one talks about God creating the best of possible worlds, which was uh, 
well, I say I don't want to mention it because it's, it's almost wrong. But you know, the, the way obviously um, Voltaire disagreed with that notion, shall we say, satirically in his famous uh, Enlightenment book, Candide. But that's a complete diversion. But it just it just struck me as uh, that that phrase is very uh, 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 evocative of that work in a modern context. I would say. Yeah, thank you for that. And it's important to note here that this this expression has, uh, it goes back to Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina, I mentioned earlier in this presentation that he also believed God had uh, emanated the best of all possible world, the best possible world. Mm -hmm. And there's debate, um, uh, El Ghazali is famous for having said that God, uh, there's nothing in possibility greater than what is, implying that God has created the best of all possible worlds. Ibn Taymiyyah then picks up on that, um, probably in what are his later writings, and affirms likewise. As long as he's, uh, he says, as long as it's clear God could have done something else because God's powerful, all powerful, but God has in fact chosen in his wise purpose to create the best possible. Um, so yeah, it's a really striking uh, result. And the reason I bring it in here is to underline that for Ibn Taymiyyah, God is acting wisely for purposes. There's intentionality here. And it's not just that God is acting intentionally intentionally, and with wise purposes, and sometimes he makes a mistake, or sometimes he does things which he, you know, aren't completely rational because, well, it could have gone either way. Um, no, God has created the best possible at every point in time. Um, it couldn't have been any better. Now, we might, and you mentioned Voltaire, we might beg to disagree, but that's part of the spiritual struggle of seeing the full reality. Uh, and we tend not to do that very well because we're stuck in our limited perspectives. Yeah. Um, any time you had going on here about God's self-sufficiency, um, you know, if God is acting on our behalf or for um, is interacting with our circumstances, and it seems God would be somehow impacted by um, what we're doing, and perhaps that suggests that God is not self-sufficient. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah says God is not indifferent, so God is interacting with us, but God ultimately does not need another. God does not e need us to be self-sufficient. So we're not actually supplying something that God lacks. Rather, God is perfected through his own acts, just as he is perfected through his attributes and his essence. So God's perfection for Ibn Taymiyyah includes not just attributes, but also acts. So if God were not acting, uh, God would be less than perfect. Um, so God is perpetually active out of God's perfection. Now, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah does draw on Ibn Sina as well as Ibn Rushd, a later philosopher, occasionally to solve problems. Um, here he draws on Ibn Sina. Uh, he invokes Ibn Sina's notion of God's self-love. So the way he does it, he invokes God's self-love as the source of God's love for believers and their worship and obedience. There's this choice quote here, again, from this treatise, Irada. What God loves of worship of him and obedience to him follows from love for himself. And love of that is the cause of his love for his believing servants. His love for believers follows from love for himself. So God doesn't love the worship of him and obedience to him because he's needy. He doesn't need us to worship him because he's lacking. No, he loves that because it's something that follows on from his love for himself. So God's love self, God's self love is the source of our uh, worship, in fact. Um, so, and it's in, it's the source of his love for our, our belief and our obedience and our love. So, um, what Ibn Taymiyyah is trying to do here is make it so we don't think about God needing us. So ultimately, for God, uh, God ultimately has no need of human worship and is fully perfect, fully perfect and self-sufficient. Good. So I'm going to make uh, take two quotations um, to conclude this presentation. Mm. Uh, one from my book in 2019, uh, accentuating what I've just been discussing. Uh, for Ibn Taymiyyah, God acts on account of wise purposes subsisting in God's essence that redound to both creatures and God himself, 
Ibn Taymiyyah's God is self-interested and utilitarian in much the same fashion as human beings. So God has an agenda, you might say. God is acting to get something um, to happen, which it's quite clear uh, to my mind that the whole God's agenda, if you will, is that um, in the end we all worship God, that all of creation, all human beings are worshiping God alone. And then uh, from this article, uh, Foundations of Ibn Taymiyyah's Religious Utilitarianism, um, I conclude here, as a theologian, ethicist, and jurist, Ibn Taymiyyah provides an Avicennan informed apology. That Avicenna refers, of course, to Ibn Sina. Ibn Taymiyyah provides an Avicennan informed apology for the utilitarian rationality of God's creation and God's command. What God creates is the best possible. And what God commands through the revealed law encompasses all benefit. This law not only specifies obligations and prohibitions, it also provides the prophet's exemplary utilitarianism as the operative principle when perfect obedience to obligations and prohibitions is too difficult or, or impossible. So you have two principles here. The law gives obligations and prohibitions first, and then second, uh, there's utilitarianism, utilitarian reasoning uh, when we have situations which are too difficult or impossible. And uh, this is the way of the prophet, according to Ibn Taymiyyah. Yep. So thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, fantastic, actually. Uh, let me just take that down. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, John, uh, for that fascinating um, uh, storyline, taking us through uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's thought on this subject and i just want to reiterate uh, as you have done uh, some of the books you mentioned this is your own book of course uh makers of the muslim world uh, i really is an excellent introduction to the whole gamut of his thought it's actually a very good uh, biographical chapter as well if you want to know his his life and and teachings in situ in, in in history so very readable good solid introduction i think to ibn taymiyyah um there's another work you, you've referenced many times i love this cover ibn taymiyyah's theological ethics by sophia uh, vasalu published by ox university press this a very rich meal i, I found this as, as mentioned you know she's often interacting with the western academic or philosophical tradition as well do recommend that um, also, another one of my, my favorites you haven't mentioned, but you've referenced the work, is this book, actually, is a study of uh, reason and revelation. And this is uh, by a friend of mine, uh, Professor Carl Sheriff al tubgi from Brandeis University in America, uh, Ibn Timir on reason and revelation. This is actually his doctoral dissertation, um, and but it's really fascinating read. If you're, if you're inter interested in epistemology, particularly a relationship between reason and faith, if you like, put very simplistically. Another work you did reference, I think, uh, Muslims under non-Muslim rule by Ibn Taymiyyah by Yahya Misho, uh, who I think is a Belgian, French-speaking uh, scholar. Excellent book. Uh, again, very readable and very relevant if you're if people had concerns about Islamic extremism and so on and how non-Muslims are treated under Islamic rule. Very salutary. Uh, and another related theme, I think, is this book by uh, translated uh, uh, Yahya Mishu again, forward by the American scholar Bruce Lawrence, uh, Ibn Timir against extremisms, um, which again is counterintuitive if you have kind of a Western notion of an uninformed Western notion of what Ibn Timir was actually about as well. So um, if I had to pick one of those uh, as a, a to, to read and benefit from, it would have to be this, of course, your own work, Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, recently uh, written. So do get that if you want to explore this titan of the Islamic tradition. I don't mean John, I mean Ibn Taymiyyah, um, to uh, appreciate his enduring influence, again, in the modern world. Many people, uh, he's experienced some kind of a renaissance in uh, people interested in Ibn Taymiyyah's thinking um, for all sorts of reasons, but he, he's certainly worth reading. So thank you so much, uh, Professor John Hoover, for your excellent presentation. Well, thank you. It's been a great pleasure, and thank you for plugging my book. Real <laughs> pleasure to be talking to you. Good. No, it's worth worthwhile reading. So uh, thank you very much. Until next time. Salam alaikum. <laughs>